Well, welcome back to Carmelite Conversations. Great pleasure to have you back with us here again this week. We are still struggling with a few technical issues with regard to our new studio. So uh, Francis and I are actually broadcasting from a home studio and using what technology is available to us. I hope the reception is good. Uh, but let me begin by welcoming Francis back into the studio after a week uh, away in uh, California. Francis, welcome back. Thank you. It's a great joy to be back. And I know you had a great program last week, and I'm looking forward to contributing to this week's. Well, we had a great program, if we did, because of the Holy Spirit, of course, uh, speaking about uh, St. Teresa Margaret of the Sacred Heart. I was reminded this week, actually, that her full name in religion is St. Teresa Margaret of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Though that's a long title, we'll intersperse it in our conversation here today. Uh, but we want to begin today um, where we pick, uh, ended last week, we'll pick up the um, entry of our saint into Carmel and the difficult parting from her father at that time, the beginning of the sacrifices that she would make and her devotion to our Lord. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, her early stages in Carmel and some of the experiences that she had. Um, and we'll also spend a little bit of time in our conversation today talking about the beginnings of her understanding and devotion to the Sacred Heart. Of course, as we discussed um, a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned again last week, the month of June, of course, is the month that the Church devotes to devotion to the Sacred Heart. And so this is a particularly appropriate saint, I think, for us to be discussing. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to explore in much greater detail um, perhaps than many of us have been exposed to in the past, an appreciation for uh, the devotion to the Sacred Heart. So we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit more this evening, and we'll continue to explore it as we explore in more detail uh, the life of St. Uh, Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But I want to begin, as we do every conversation, with prayer. And so, uh, Francis, would you lead us in prayer? Well, since we just recently passed Trinity Sunday, and we like to stay in tune with the liturgical year, I selected this prayer that St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus um, uh, created, and it's called Prayer to the Trinity. It's very short, but I think it's very powerful. So let us begin by getting recollected, looking at Jesus within, and signing ourselves in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To you be love, praise, honor, glory. To you be expressions of deep gratitude, O most holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, our one God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Francis. Uh, I had intended, I wasn't sure what... Uh, your travel experience might be coming back from the West Coast. And to be honest, I was prepared uh, for the unfortunate eventuality that you might not make it back. I was quite concerned <laughs> like about it. <laughs> and praying, by the way, every day in, in your absence. Uh, not only you. that uh, you'd make it back to the radio program, but frankly, just that you'd make it back safely. Thank you. Um, but I um, had prepared uh, my own uh, version of a prayer, if you will, again, uh, quite frankly, taken from St. Teresa Margaret. And it's really not a prayer as much as it is a poem, a poem that she herself wrote. And I also thought it was appropriate um, as a way to begin. And maybe, uh, Francis, if I can, I'll ask you to uh, cite that poem, recite that poem, um, as sort of an entry into our conversation here today, if you wouldn't mind. I'd be happy to, Mark. <clears throat> and thank you for your prayers. <laughs> This is from a letter that St. Teresa Margaret Reddy wrote to her father, and she wrote this part in verse, and this is how it goes. From my beloved cell, where I dwell in peace, if one finds it to his liking, I am coming to greet you. Truly, I have great pleasure in entering the monastery, but my joy shall be greater still when I find myself really within. Permit me at least to embrace you with delight and show you at the same time the happiness of my heart. I find such great pleasure in this delightful sojourn that it seems only a day that I have been here. Never as at present 
have I been happy and content. I am well, but sickness nor suffering frightens me. My delights will always be to keep joyous this wonderful company and to see it rested. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. That amen. poem strikes me as like a prayer, although it was uh, obviously, as you indicated, Francis, written to her father. Um, it came after that time when she had that painful separation from her father. And we can only imagine, I think, uh, how difficult that might have been. This is a man, and of course, we just celebrated Father's Day, so isn't right. it appropriate uh, that we reflect on this? A man who had been her first spiritual director, uh, who she was particularly devoted to, and we know he was particularly devoted to his daughter. Um, and this can be a very difficult time for a young uh, girl or a boy uh, to be separated from one of their parents. But she knew even then she understood that this was part of the process of um, her purification and the perfection of her love. It's perhaps important uh, to point out that there was a brief moment of doubt on the part of Anna Maria Reddy, our future saint, uh, Teresa Margaret, uh, before she approached her final entry into Carmel. She actually approached a Father Colombino, who was actually a Carmelite provincial for the Florence, and had been, in fact, the father who had, uh, at her father's request, her own father's request, had sort of given her the final test as to whether yes. she had adequately discerned her entry, uh, entry into Carmel. Uh, as she shared her concerns, uh, apparently uh, focused around this rather extraordinary manner in which her vocation had been uh, revealed to her. And we talked a little bit about it, I think, in the first week, and I met, uh, mentioned it in, in uh, the follow-on um, broadcast last week. Yes, she had a friend that was going to join the Carmelite Monastery, and before they entered in, they made a habit of going to visit different families, and their family and her family were friends, and so she came, and she really didn't get to speak individually to Teresa Margaret, um, at that time, Anna Maria, and um, yet there was something in that handshake that seemed to beckon to Teresa Margaret Reddy, and after this person left, then Teresa Margaret Reddy has this um, locution mm -hmm. where she hears this interior voice, which she thought was the voice of Teresa of Avila, mm -hmm. and inviting her, telling her that she wanted her in the Carmel. Right. And that uh, moment, which I walked uh, our audience through last week, um, even now at this stage as she's uh, beginning to uh, prepare herself for entry, uh, raises questions in her own mind. And uh, this Carmelite priest, Father Colombino, um, reading from the text, actually, that we've cited, From the Sacred Heart to the Trinity, by Father Gabriel of St. Maria Magdalene, a Carmelite priest himself, we read, If we might make a judgment from the answer that Father Colombino offered, which is preserved for us, it's in letters, it seems that the doubt revolved around this extraordinary manner in which the saint's vocation was manifested. The good father, nonetheless, reassured the little nun and made her see how the doubt was nothing more than a temptation from the devil. And Francis, I have to ask you, because as director of formation and having been in Carmel longer than I have, you have more experience with this. Have you ever known somebody who was about to enter Carmel who may have faced doubts <laughs> yes. and questions? Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, and of course, we know uh, if you've read the story of St. Therese the Little Flower, which I know you have, but for those in our listening audience, she had those same kind of temptations uh, right before she made her final profession. So yes, it, it can happen. And so it is good to speak to someone about it. Don't just decide on your own. That's the worst thing to do. It's best to seek out someone um, who you trust, who um, is learned preferably, um, and uh, you are willing to convey with candor uh, the, with openness in your heart what has happened so that they can help in the discernment to make clear uh, what, what is God's will for you. We talked about that last week as well, or at least I shared the um, reflections of uh, uh, Teresa Margaret on her willingness and um, her commitment to be very open and honest with her spiritual director. That's a challenge for, for many. Uh, but I think the point we'd like to uh, raise here, Francis and I, is anytime uh, 
that you are making an additional commitment to our Lord in whatever capacity, if it's prayer, if it's works of charity, maybe it is a vocation. Marriage. Yeah, you might well anticipate the involvement of the enemy. In fact, uh, I was talking to a priest a few weeks ago and he shared with me that St. John Vianney's opinion was anytime he was on the verge of either converting a soul or on the verge of a great feast day, which we have both experienced recently and will again this weekend, um, you might well anticipate the involvement of the enemy to try to distract us, to discourage us, and, and to sort of set, up, set us off course. So should we need to be aware of that. You know, one of the things, Francis, you and I have emphasized time and time again over the many years, albeit we've just begun again, but the years that we did this program, is that we want to try to give people practical advice. We want to help them understand what they might expect to face in their spiritual journey. And so we say one of the things you can expect is if you're going to turn and desire a deeper intimacy with the Lord, there is an opposing force on the other side that wants to uh, deter you from that. So please be aware of that. Cover yourself in prayer. I said last week, if you want to learn from Teresa Margaret, pray to her and ask her to intercede on your behalf. That's great advice. Well, once she was safely inside the Carmel and was beginning in the monastery, she, who was Anna Maria Reddy before receiving her religious name, she she gets to choose her religious name, and she chose Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart because of her love for Margaret Mary Alacoque, who had a great devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And um, so at that point, she also decides, this is Teresa Margaret Reddy, um, decides to write an oblation, um, which simply means making an offering to God, and of course, in all sincerity. In this case, our future saint, she wrote her brief but powerful oblation in her own blood. It reminds me of Teresa uh, or Therese, who also wrote some things about. So this might have been a common practice back then. I don't know. <laughs> it's well, not it, a common it wasn't, practice now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. It wasn't uncommon. I discovered. I did a little research on this. It wasn't uncommon, but it wasn't um, publicized. It wasn't widely publicized. Mm -hmm. so some people, even today, I can imagine some people might be taken aback by it. Uh, but it was a simple matter of pricking her finger, which would issue forth enough blood that she could put on the tip of a pen, and, right. and she wrote her oblation. So, you know, you're, you're, you're paying for this prayer with your life's blood, basically. <laughs> and what the prayer was, was this. My Jesus, my love, I resolve to be yours, regardless of the repugnance I might have to face. Yeah, that might seem like a less than eloquent commitment on her part, but there are a few key points that I think are worth examining. First, we mentioned, Francis, it's written in her own blood. That's a commitment in and of itself. It wasn't something completely unknown, as we said, but it was rather unique still for a young girl of this age to do something like this. Additionally, though, this statement is extremely brief and to the yes. point. It's not lengthy, which you and I are both familiar with another oblation, and we may cover that, by the way, at some a future a conversation, but it's extremely brief and to the point. It simply says, Jesus, I'm yours. Finally, we're somewhat uh, perhaps uh, put off by this term repugnant. She says, regardless of the repugnance, but it's clear that our future saint knew something about the struggles she would have to face in the religious vocation. And she wanted to make clear to our Lord and to herself, I think more to the point, that she was setting out on this course of love and there would, would be nothing that would stop her. Yes, I now, this issue of repugnance is going to come back up again in our conversation today. So I'll leave it there for the moment because uh, it is a somewhat uh, confusing, perhaps off-putting as I use the term uh, word, but we'll return to it. I, I think in this statement also we see <laughs> the sense of determined determination yes. that St. Teresa of Avila would speak about and also... The great need for courage and perseverance, which yeah. St. Teresa of Osvaldo also talk about. So the entire theme of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy, um, her spiritual journey, can be summed up succinctly in all the things she simply sought in her own words, which was her motto, to return love for love. Yeah, say something about that. I think that's so important that we understand that as, as we get ready to talk about the Sacred Heart. Well, we, we first are loved, and so we receive, that's important, we have to receive God's love and then return to God's love. And everything that uh, allows us to do that is, and we'll cite this scripture verse later actually, 
Uh, we love because we were first loved, right? It's not that we develop this capacity for love. We dispose ourselves to it. But the work of maturing ourselves in love, of transforming ourselves in love, is really the work of the Holy Spirit within us. If we feel inadequate on day one, mm -hmm. when we read these words, that's a good place to be. <laughs> and I always marvel in one of the works of St. Teresa of Avila. She's, she's writing to her nuns, and you might ask what love is. And, and she's like, and I don't blame you for asking because, you know, when, when you're feeling numb in a sense or you're feeling aridity or dryness, uh, you're like, well, what is love? And, you know, and, and really the sense of giving of self, making effort of self to do something for the good of another. Yeah. Importantly, what you didn't say, Francis is it's emotion, it's a good feeling, it's, <laughs> it's, not it's that. <laughs> all that giddy stuff that we talk about, right? And oh, isn't that what I'm supposed to feel? No, it is actually an act of the will, right? Love right. is an act of the will. And when emotion is gone, which it will be in the midst of purification, we rest on the act of the will. I desire to love you, God. I don't know if I'm doing it well. I don't know if I'm in, even doing it at all, but I desire to do it. That's an act of the will, and that confirms us in our love. Right. Furthermore, according to his work, From the Sacred Heart to the Trinity, by the Carmelite priest, Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene, who we love, <laughs> explains that St. Teresa Margaret Reddy's approach to overcoming her own desires and the focus on herself, what her plan of conquest, as he referred to it, was to constantly practice to the greatest extent possible, asceticism based on the two great instruments of Carmelite spirituality, which you and I practice, Mark, detachment and recollection. Now, to be completely clear, St. Teresa of Avila would also have added humility, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Francis, we know that, to this list. And we're going to add that because St. Teresa Margaret actually does add it later in her own uh, theology. Um, and she's very keen, actually, on the practice of humility in her own actions. But let's take a moment and discuss each of these three terms, because I think they're very important for us to, to fully understand. First, I want to talk about asceticism. Asceticism, it's actually a Greek term, and it means exercise or training. Uh, many of us are familiar, of course, with the practical means of asceticism, fasting, cold showers, waking at night to pray. These are all very good and necessary means of helping to bring our bodies under submission or exercise them or train them for spiritual work. And the first exercise that St. Teresa Margaret Reddy described was detachment. Now, this began for her actually at a very early age. She uh, continued it after she entered Carmel, but even in her earliest years as she began to mature in her understanding of her relationship to the Lord, she practiced detachment. In fact, her very entry into Carmel, as we discussed a moment ago, provided her the greatest opportunity to exercise this uh, uh, ideal of detachment, and that was when she had to leave her father behind and the world behind to enter the lifetime enclosure of Carmel. In her own words, again, we can hear her commitment to this spiritual principle and we can practice it solely, she practiced it solely out of love for our Lord. She said, To detach self completely from all natural inclinations in order to adhere better to you, my divine creator. Now I have to add here that um, as she was approaching this moment, she was given some good direction yeah. uh, in that they said, well, now you need to really, you know, be prepared and ha practice self-composure here because it is going to be harder on your father because you're leaving yeah. uh, and yet you are going to something you're choosing, but they didn't choose for you to leave. You're choosing of your own. So it's going to be harder for your father. So you need to, to have this self-composure so that his pain will be lessened because if you fall apart, you know, he, he's going to be a mess, <laughs> basically. Yeah. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But anyway... Um, St. Teresa Margaret Reddy really did desire to submerge and overcome her own will in favor of whatever the Lord might allow to come into her life and however he might choose to direct her path. Now, the second of these classic Carmelite spiritual principles, which you mentioned, uh, Mark, was recollection. So, recollection is described by St. Teresa of Avila in this way. Quote, and this is from the Way of Perfection, chapter 28, verse 4. This prayer is called recollection because the soul collects its faculties together and enters within itself to be with its God. Now, Mark, 
just expand on the word faculties just briefly here. Yeah, faculties are our um, ability to perceive our surroundings. How's that? It's our intellect, it's our sight, it's our hearing, it's our senses. All of those aspects of our character that could serve as diversions, as distractions, as a way of drawing us out of ourselves and into the world, right? We hear sounds, we listen to noise, we, we hear news, and we gain, engage in conversations. All of these things can serve as distractions. What Teresa of Avila was saying is recollect, draw all those back in, focus them back on your center in the Lord. I will just say this about recollection. It is well worth reading everything that Teresa uh, of Avila said about recollection. I really think she's the master of it. In addition, I would ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what recollection is because I will say this, I don't think it is something we can grasp exclusively by our intellect. We can sit here, Francis, and have a conversation about it, but until the Holy Spirit has revealed to your heart what is meant by recollection, we can't adequately perceive it. I'll give you another example. Say, to Catherine of Siena said, create a cell within your heart and enter into it. Very That's good. a nice analogy. I like it. But it's still, for some, may be insufficient to adequately understand. It is far deeper. I will just say this as closing. It is far deeper than we understand or than we appreciate. Recollection is the centerpiece of our encountering the living God within our souls. And we it bears considerable uh, uh, meditation and, and reflection on our part to adequately understand it. So we see here that recollection requires us to regather our faculties, our senses, our thoughts, centering our emotions and entering within ourselves. And I'm thinking of Elizabeth of Trinity here because she's so good at this. And then in quiet peace, um, we listen and we hope to hear the Lord speak to us deep in our interior. And we're not talking about locutions here. No, we're, no. We're talking about this intuitive, perceptive listening. We can do this on ourselves, right, Francis? Right. That's the important point is that Teresa of Avila to say, this is available to you. This is not something uh, that the Lord has to infuse. It's not a practice, however, that one develops overnight. You can immediately say the importance of it. Uh, of detachment as regards it, it must play a central role, detachment that is, in the exercise of recollection. We simply cannot enter in and find quiet within ourselves if our minds and our hearts are filled with all of those thoughts and plans and desires in short, if we're filled with self. Right. We're not going to be able to practice recollection. So you see the importance of detachment from the world and we're going to understand a little bit better what detachment really means in the context of Carmel. And that as a means of entering into recollection. Well, Francis, I see we've gotten close here and, and perhaps it's a good time uh, for us to take a break. Um, I do want to uh, just emphasize again, we're going to come back and talk about this idea of detachment and the importance of detachment as a means of our entering into the practice of recollection. But a reminder, you're listening to Carmelite Conversations on Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We'll be right back. We're now back with the show, Carmelite Conversations with Mark and Francis. Well, welcome back to Carmelite Conversations. We're picking up on the uh, discussion of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We get to use her whole name occasionally, Francis, so we'll insert it there. And we were talking about recollection and detachment, and I want to circle back uh, on the theme of detachment. And I said before, and in fact, uh, probably as good a time as any, Francis, for us to reemphasize two points uh, with regard to the genesis of our radio program and where we really want to take it. And the first is, we want to help uh, seculars, those like Francis and myself who live in the world and have all of the responsibilities associated with that, to understand what is necessary to develop a deep contemplative experience and encounter with the living God. Right. The second is that we don't want to sugarcoat that. We want to be very honest. I think even more so perhaps, Francis, than we were in our first uh, six some odd years, if I recall, uh, of broadcasting. We want to be very uh, forthright and uh, not that we weren't completely honest, but we want to tell uh, the very real story about what it takes to enter into this experience. We should speak about the richness of it and the benefits um, that come from this uh, contemplative encounter, but we also want to be honest. And so here's another one of those examples uh, of um, explaining what is meant by some of this terminology. And the first is detachment. What St. Teresa Margaret Reddy would come to discover very quickly, in fact, 
um, was that it is within the will that one must practice detachment. And here's the distinction I would draw. We think of detachment as, well, I'll detach myself from television or sweets or uh, maybe I'll wake myself in the middle of the night sacrificing my, my eight hours uh, uh, otherwise perhaps of sleep. Those are practices. Those are uh, ascetical practices of detachment. But what she's going to discover is the real asceticism of detachment is found in the will. In other words, not practicing what it is her desire within her own will to practice, even when that might seem the most beneficial thing. Francis, you have a story to share with us about this regarding uh, St. Teresa Margaret. I'm going to invite you to do that now so that our audience can get a better understanding of it. Well, this comes from Margaret Rose's book, God is Love, which is about St. Teresa Margaret Reddy. And it's customary when uh, a postulant uh, is coming into Carmel that, that they're going to make it a little easy on them at the beginning because if they jumped right into doing exactly like those who have been there for 20 and 30 years, uh, they might just fall apart. <laughs> so, uh, because it's very demanding and it's rigorous and uh, even though they might know in advance what the schedule is that the, the nuns keep, it, it's still, to put it into practice, is challenging. And so, for example... Um, I'll say someone in their first year would likely not be required to rise for matins or the night office. They would uh, possibly receive a more pleasant assortment of food at meals and other means of eating. Um, there, there be other means of easing them into the rigors of the schedule uh, of this new style of life. In the case of Teresa Margaret, well, she didn't want any of this relief. She had been used to uh, setting up, uh, you know, a, a very set, rigorous uh, lifestyle in advance. And choosing it on her and own. choosing it on her own. Um, so she would continue to ask to be allowed to go to these extra hours of prayer and that, you know, be, be happy to receive the courses of foods just like all the other sisters. Um, and, you know, when they were new, they would give them a little extra padding on their bed uh, so it wouldn't be so hard and, you know, they'd get to adjust gradually. But, you know, she was anxious to get rid of this padding. And Margaret Rowe explains it like this. She says, it never occurred to the postulant, and she's speaking of Teresa Margaret Reddy, that there was anything in her attitude that might appear to question the discretion or authority of her superiors because Teresa Margaret was used to uh, following her own desires when it came to the austerity she wished to practice. So she's thinking she's wanting a good thing by saying, you know, take this mattress away and give me the harsh food. And, you know, uh, but her prioress uh, saw something that most people didn't see. Her prioress, Mother Mary Magdalene, heard about the removal of the mattress and she immediately ordered St. Teresa Margaret Reddy to put that mattress back on her bed. So Teresa Margaret had begun to learn the hard lesson here about how we're not ever going to be allowed to make ourselves holy uh, for the simple reason that we cannot. In the effort on the part of the postulant Teresa Margaret, according to Margaret Rowe, she was act actually opting for her own will, you know, choosing to get rid of the mattress. She's thinking she's doing a good thing, and yet she was, in actuality, denying the superior's uh, order. And so she was preferring uh, her harder choice to what the superior had ordered, and who ordered the dispensation, in effect. And so, um, in effect, here, Teresa Margaret Reddy had to learn that it, it wasn't the practice that was so important, it was the obedience and the denial of the self-will. Yeah, something occurred in a similar vein with regard to the food that she was asked to eat. There was a day uh, when the mother, Anna Maria, um, who, who oversaw the postulants, um, discovered Anna Maria, Teresa Margaret, not eating her food. And she says, is something wrong, sister? And uh, Teresa Margaret refers, no, indeed, mother, it's very delicious. Well, then eat it up. It's good for you. Teresa Margaret still hesitated. Come now, are you going to allow it to spoil and waste the good food as well as the time and the trouble of preparing it? And Teresa Margaret's response is, well, it's too tasty. 
The sister then ordered her to eat every scrap. <laughs> this is a command. By doing so, you will have the merit of obedience. Besides, you will need the strength, for I'm going to read you a lecture directly, and you'll have finished your meal. Here's the direction that she gave her. She went away, and she got a book, and she came back, and she said, Now listen to this. This is the assistant mistress again, uh, Mother Anna Maria. And she's reading from the constitutions for that Carmel. The sick should try to give proof of the virtues they have acquired in health by bearing their sufferings patiently and endeavoring to cause as little trouble and disturbance as possible. Uh, now you must understand, clearly, there are two ways of looking at these things. Um, and the sister says, Had I brought you a plate of stringy old beans cooked without salt or oil, or by chance uh, left a da let a dash of paraffin uh, fall into them, you would have eaten it without any appearance of relish because that is just the kind of penance that you would want for yourself. It's no less meritorious than to eat something that is tasty but which displeases you from another point of view and that is um, an act of charity on your part uh, for the one who prepares it. Here's another point she says no sister shall find fault with what is served at the table whether it be little or much well or badly prepared. Let's take that one to our yeah. family table, right? <laughs> In other words, if it's if it's too good for you, uh, choosing not to eat it is as uncharitable as choosing uh, to eat it. Or I'm sorry, not to eat it when it is not the pleasing. Right. You're supposed to you're supposed to eat what you're given. Period. Exactly right. So, <laughs> well, she um, gives a, an example of Saint Teresa of Avila um, because there was one time when when Holy Mother Teresa. Of Avila said, once when I was thinking how it distressed me to eat meat and do no penance, I heard these words, sometimes there is more self-love in such a thought than desire of penance. So, you know, don't be discouraged. Perfection is not gained in a day. It's a lifetime's work. And sometimes we're confused at what it means. Again, in Teresa Margaret's case, she thought, oh, the more rigorous and demanding I can be on myself, the holier I'll be. No, and, only to the extent that you're obedient to what the right. rule says and what the instruction is that you've been given. And I have seen that in many souls aspiring to holiness. They take a harder path, but they have, have lost sight of the obedience to the superior. So it's important. Well, again, Margaret Rose says very succinctly, Teresa Margaret had to learn in all these small ways that from now on her chief mortification must consist in submitting to the will of another person, accepting privations or their alleviation as well if that was what was ordered. And so to Francis's point, that's exactly um, what we are sometimes called upon to do. And the Lord will use examples like this to test us well, I've made the path easy for you. Oh, no, I don't want an easy path. I want the harder path. No, understand if you use the word, I want the harder path, you put your will first. <laughs> yeah, your focus is on I, not on me. St. Augustine actually um, uh, made this very easy for us to stand, uh, understand when he said, perfect love has neither the desire of this world nor the fear of losing it, neither does the desire to acquire temporal things, nor the fear of losing them. In other words, it's simply obedient to what it is that the individual has been called to in this life. Love him. Do you hear me? This is the story of her younger brother. And Francis, I'm actually going to ask you uh, to tell us this story because I think this is also um, very uh, revealing as to who our saint is. And I'll just give the background. Um, when a young lady entered the Carmel, there was a very brief period of time when they were allowed to return home. Right. Um, and it was largely done so that they could test whether the vocation was real. In this case, she didn't actually return home. She went to a wealthy woman's um, estate in Florence. Her father joined her there. And a few weeks later, the father asked that two of the brothers might come and join uh, them there. And so the one brother... Cacino, is that how you pronounce it? Cacino, yeah. Cacino. Okay, so... You're the uh, Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm French. <laughs> okay, but I took Spanish and Latin. Okay, so. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all righty. Um, well, anyway, so uh, Anna Maria is talking to her brother, and she says, Cacino, what do you want of God? And you can just imagine this when, when people who are aspiring to holiness, they're getting together and they're having these spiritual conversations. And Kachina's kind of surprised, but he says, why, um, to become better than I am. And she says, Kachina, do you want to do good for God? And he says, well, as well as I can, sinner than I am. 
Then Anna Maria gets right up in his face real close, and she spoke with such intensity. Francis never um, forgot about this. And she says, love him. Do you hear me? Love God very much. For you know how lovable and loving he is, how precious is his love, and how worthwhile is every effort we make to attain it. Now this is before she gets in and lives this life of Carmel. She's she's been introduced, but now she's out before the clothing ceremony. Right. And uh, so she already has this sense of this great love of the Lord. It's important to note she was actually in deep prayer before this encounter with her brother. And you can almost imagine, Francis, uh, you know, put the image in your mind that she's grabbed his face with both hands on his cheeks, right? And she's yeah. pulled him directly into her face. And she's eye looking eye at contact. Him. Yeah. <laughs> and she's saying, look, let me be very clear. This is what this journey is all and about. And of course, he brings this up at the, the process of canonization, you know, as they right. uh, talk about all of that. Well, this process of making saints, as we know, is not an easy one. And though it may well uh, be understood when one reads about it, Um, it's important to understand that the knowledge is seldom retained when one actually lives through the process. And Francis, if you don't mind, I'd ask you to read uh, the quote uh, that we have here about just how difficult the work of the Holy Spirit is on a soul that desires, as she has already expressed to her brother in that exchange, to love him above all things. To him who sets no limit to his love and gift of self, God imposes no bounds to his graces. Already his favors had been so many that, as she herself said, we swim in them as fish in the ocean. Now it was necessary that deeper caverns be hollowed out if more were to be received. This hollowing can be done only by cutting and rooting out all imperfections that remain as obstacles, little attachments and preferences Slight shoots of self-love, touchiness, and self-will. Small failings in humility and charity because of deficiency in self-knowledge. And as one is cutting out her living flesh, this excavation is always a painful and sometimes a violent process. It can never be achieved without suffering or endured without love. So yeah, and that's it, that's the reality of it, right? That's the reality. This is the this is the hard truth that we um, had agreed, Francis. We were going to share with our listeners. This is taken from Margaret Rose's book, uh, but we uh, both are, are well aware uh, of the challenges required for the grace to be raised to this intimate union with our Lord. If it's something we desire in this life, we will all be raised to it uh, in the next life. But the measure of our commitment in this life will determine the degree to which we will serve the Lord. And that has to be born of love. It cannot be born of a sheer determination or energy or effort on our part. It is only born of love. And we are transformed, as we said in the beginning of our conversation, by love, not because we love, but because we love because he first loved us. That's what is the source of this. And we must start today. Do not put this off. The Lord wants our love today. He is waiting eagerly with open arms and open heart, begging you to let him into your heart, to bring you close to him, to bless you, to keep you. And um, so and do not put you. it off. Yes, and transform, and transform you. Thank so you. what's the source of this? Well, in addition to her focus on detachment, on recollection, on humility, we said we'd talk about that, this whole agenda of asceticism there was one other pillar in saint Teresa margaret's spiritual agenda and it's the last part of her name and religion i said we'd use it in complete a form a number of times saint Teresa margaret of the sacred heart of jesus according to her spiritual director while she was in carmel a father ill defense and recorded by the way in the book by father gabriel mary magdalene saint Teresa margaret considered the sacred heart the center of the manifestation of love of the divine word, who loved us from all eternity in the bosom of the Father, and who, thanks uh, to this same love, has obtained for us the ability to love him in return, both here on earth and in heaven, by participating in his love. This is the meaning which she, 
found and gave to this devotion, making it consist completely in loving in return from, for the one who loved us first, Francis said. Loving in return for the love. That is her, her great um, uh, motto. And that's and, from John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We loved because he first loved us. You know, in many of the talks, uh, Francis, that I've given on retreats, I focus on this theme of growing in our capacity for love. But this is only true to the extent that we come to allow God to love us and then to love through us, our brothers and sisters. It requires that we adopt the very sentiments of and allow ourselves to be transformed into the very heart of Jesus. We come to love both him and our brothers and sisters then with the same love with which he loved us. It's not something we can do for ourselves. We must be purified and transformed. Our hearts are not capable of this. By allowing the Holy Spirit to change our stone hearts into the new hearts of flesh and flame. I love how you say that. <laughs> flesh and flame. Yes, yes, that was very well put. Well, Mark. I drew it from the image that I used, frankly, for the program last week of the Sacred Heart. And I know you're familiar. I think you might have... Uh, introduced me to it, and that is the Sacred Heart with the flame uh, atop of it, in, indicating very clearly that this process is a purification, and fire is obviously involved. Yes, because this is the same flame that he wishes to burn away all of our imp imperfections, and then replace them with his own capacity for love, this fire of divine love, and we get from Hebrews 12, verse 29, for our God indeed is a consuming fire. Teresa Margaret also understood that this process would mean a painful process of purification for her heart. Now we need to take that to our own heart. To, to grow in holiness is a process of transformation and there is some pain involved because we're so attached to our self-will. Um, but as Teresa Margaret herself described it, she, she would need to clear the palace of vulgar people and junk. Makes yeah. me think of what Teresa Vaughn was talking about in the Tyr Castle uh, about the vipers. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Teresa Margaret's understanding of the developing uh, relationship between herself and the Lord was that she must learn to abandon herself entirely to the Sacred Heart. It didn't matter, by the way, what challenges her life might present at, at any moment. It didn't matter what suffering she might be asked to endure. It didn't matter what confusion she might experience or what she might uh, not understand about how the Lord was working in a particular situation. Recall now that uh, statement in her oblation and her use of the term repugnance. Certainly anytime we find ourselves in a trial or lost in confusion of what might be happening to us, most especially if we come to experience the Lord's absence, uh, as she would very soon, any of us would find this condition repugnant, uh, very unpleasant. Her plan of conquest, as Francis phrased it earlier, was to bury herself in the sacred heart of Jesus and to return, continuously return love for love. In many ways, her understanding of the sacred heart was well ahead of its time. She did have the writings of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who's famous uh, for the devotion to the sacred heart. She seemed to grasp the depth of this devotion and her understanding both anticipated and informed two later popes who wrote encyclicals about the devotion to the Sacred Heart. And they were Pope Pius XI and Pius XII. Pius XI actually went so far as in his admiration and devotion to the Sacred Heart that he wrote, and I quote, We do not hesitate to affirm that the cult, that means devotion, uh, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is the most effective school of divine charity. I don't know that you could say it any more succinctly than that. But honestly, it was actually Pope Pius XII and his encyclical. And I'm not going to do well with the, uh, the Latin here, Francis. I don't know if that's uh, something you're more comfortable with. But it's basically draw water. That's the translation. Um, and he really outlined the specifics of the devotion of the Sacred Heart. Drawing waters actually refers to Isaiah 12, 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. These wells of salvation actually are nothing other than the manifest graces that are available to all of us within the sacred heart of our Savior Jesus Christ. And I think maybe we might do an expanded program on that encyclical down the road um, if you want. So what Teresa Margaret took from her devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus was a very simple yet clear understanding of her call in Carmel. And this personified 
in the person of Christ, her whole program of her ascent, which was love. And it just amazes me because prior to Teresa Margaret Reddy, the Sacred Heart, in Florence you have St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, yeah. who, who is also incorrupt and buried in Florence and also had this great experience of, of God is love. And so, I, you know, it's just like Carmelite's got a double portion there, right? Yeah. In this regard, there were two key Bible verses that Teresa Margaret memorized and that she made the centerpiece of her scriptural focus. Now, I want to just stop for a second and, and reiterate again, Francis, we said we're going to try to give counsel, we're going to give guidance, we're going to give direction on uh, things that we can practically apply to our life. I know this for um, uh, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity and her focus on um, her uh, particular scripture verses, which were most meaningful for her, Latum Gloriae, right? A praise, praise of God's God. glory from Paul's letters. Um, here, uh, Teresa Margaret Reddy, and we'll share these. I'll ask Francis to share them, but I want to emphasize this. If there is a scripture verse that keeps ringing in your head, that resonates when you read it from, from your uh, biblical uh, study and reading, it may well be the Holy Spirit is pointing you in the direction of your individual vocation. This is a vocation, uh, in this particular case, devotion to the Sacred Heart, worthy of all of our consideration. A Pope has said as much. Um, but I would encourage each of us to think about what is it that the Holy Spirit may be guiding and directing me to in my personal journey. If, if um, there isn't something in uh, particular at this point, these are two good scripture verses worth considering for all of us. The first one's from Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. And the second one is from Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now here's how Teresa Margaret sort of applied this to her personal life. She wrote, you must not allow yourself to become absorbed in external occupations which you are obliged to perform. She said this, by the way, to one of her sisters. By keeping the better part, we know that term, that is the heart and the mind for God and yourself, you will converse exclusively and readily with God. You will begin to live in and for Jesus, putting on little by little his mind, his spirit of submission, his simple and blind obedience to the Father's will, his humility, his love of meekness, and above all, his love. I love this because she's really telling us to get inside of Jesus and, and learn to think the way Jesus thinks. You know, ask yourself as you read a gospel passage, you know, what, was, what, was, what do you think Jesus could have been thinking or feeling as he spoke these words? And so as we put on the mind of Christ, it helps to transform our own lives and our own thinking. You know, it was her greatest desire to hide herself in the sacred heart, just as if she were in a desert. And this understanding leads us to another aspect that, that Mark in, uh, mentioned last week, and that was her desire to be hidden. Or Marie, more accurately, I would say, to be seen like everyone else. She didn't want to stand out. So that when the canonization process was beginning, they're like, Teresa Margaret, well, good, yeah, but holy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's just like everybody else. <laughs> so, yeah, in fact, that phrase that, that she was noted for was that she wanted to hide herself in the sacred heart as in a desert. She wanted to literally be hidden in the sacred heart. She didn't want to reveal this secret that dwelt within her own heart uh, or, or, or make it sort of... Uh, you know, obvious to all of those around her. In fact, she wanted it to be anything but that. Uh, regarding this particular desire, Teresa Margaret again draws on the life of Jesus. She looked at his early years in Nazareth, and with the exception of finding him in the temple, that narrative at age 12, we know little or nothing about Jesus's hidden life. She adopted this as her model. Um, this reminded me, frankly, of the teaching of um, one of our Carmelite friars, and you'll know his name, Francis, who talked to us one time about, uh, would you still want to be holy if nobody knew you were holy, if nobody thought you were holy? And in fact, if they thought you were the opposite of holy, would you still pursue holiness? I think Teresa Margaret would. Uh, and in fact, she might revel in the fact that she wasn't necessarily thought of as a holy person. Her approach for doing this was actually quite simple. She only needed to remind herself of her total dependence on God. This is true of all of us, by the way. We're all dependent creatures. We must rely on grace for everything. We don't always 
keep this fact in mind, and that's to our uh, discredit. We might even argue at, against it at times. But for Teresa Margaret, it was actually the anchor that allowed her to remain grounded in her humility and in her hiddenness. Well, I think we're running out of time again. Boy, I know, this hour just goes by so <laughs> fast. So I know we can pick up here um, next week, uh, finish talking about this hiddenness, which is so important, and then you know touch on this, the humility that goes with the hiddenness. I think we need to, to talk about that. Yeah, um, I think we've agreed we're probably going to need a couple more weeks to do <laughs> Teresa Margaret it's, justice. It's, it's so rich. <laughs> there is a lot to mine in her brief life of 22 years and five months. Um, I'm always reminded minded to, to share that. Uh, but um, it, there is a great deal here. She is really very powerful for us in our spiritual journey and a great uh, guide and mentor in our spiritual journey. Well, we are going to close and I appreciate uh, all of you listening to Carmelite Conversations on Radio Maria, Christian Voice in Your Home. But we're going to ask Francis, if you would, please pray us out this evening. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the words of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy, O oh my God, reflecting that you have made me to love and serve you, I am determined to renounce my own inclinations in order to follow the way it pleases you to lead me. I shall strive always to obey. May I learn from you, my God, who made yourself obedient for me in far more difficult circumstances. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us again on Carmelite Conversations. We we'll look forward to being with you again next week. Until then, God bless.